Good morning. Today we are reading from Exodus. We are continuing to follow the Israelite family. And today we will begin with the 12th chapter of Exodus. We're reading verses 1 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goat. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its heads, with its head, (laughs) legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals, on all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and for as many of us as it is possible, we rejoice in this day that you have given us. Lord, may all of this worship design arrive to speak to your people in such times as now. And may the message be powerful in spite of the messenger And may your people receive unleavened bread for their journey. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'd like to use as a sermonic theme this morning the Passover party. The Passover party. Chadwick Boseman died last week of complications related to his diagnosis of colon cancer, which he was diagnosed in 2016. Chadwick is many things, perhaps, to many people, but to the world, he was a powerful actor. He played Jackie Robinson in 42, which we showed to our Open Breakfast retreat last year. No, actually, this year. He played Thurgood Marshall in Marshall, the movie, and more recently, he received international fame for his role as a superhero in the Black Panther movie. This movie was what Roots was for my mother's generation. Churches and groups rented out whole theaters. 
People got their faces painted. People got dressed up in wardrobes to go out and see this movie. Chadwick the whole time was in a relationship with two kids who were terminally ill, who were trying to hold out until the Black Panther movie would come out. People are amazed that while battling cancer, he would go on to have major movie accomplishments. He would go on to play in nine more movies, all under the diagnosis of colon cancer. Through surgeries and chemotherapy, he would still live his life, and his cancer would progress from stage three to stage four. But the cancer did not stop him from living his life and living his dreams. It is important for us to celebrate the accomplishments in our lives. A mentor once told me, always have some small tasks that you are working on to balance out the harder struggle, the harder spiritual warfare that we are in for justice and love and grace to abide in our world. He had a whole Home Depot section in his garage where he would fix this thing or that. And I think he had a point. No matter how hard things got in his life, he was able to fix and maneuver and accomplish small projects. Maybe a puzzle over the family dining room table, or a cleaning project that has your name on it, or renovating a part of your home as my friend is doing, or even writing a book. We've had some people to publish books this year. Reupholstering a chair, cooking a meal, for those on the front line, providing childcare for a parent who has to work. Finally, making it to the alderman shredding event to shred all those documents you've been storing for decades, reconnecting with family members and friends on Zoom calls, making a knitted outfit for your grandbaby, making masks for inmates, Getting physical exercise through Zoom class. Ah, hosting an open breakfast for our patrons. These are all accomplishments that we should be proud of. It doesn't take away from how increasingly impactful COVID has been on our lives this year, but it balances it. This is where we enter the biblical text today. Woo, did you get a mouthful? So last Sunday, we learned that there was a new Pharaoh and that this ruler did not like the Jews. We have been following the Israelites for some time, mostly through main families, Jacob and Joseph. But now we are focusing on them as a people and on one leader in particular that God has called out Moses. God, according to the text, has looked down and he has seen the Israelites and how they are being treated. And so he reached out to Moses as a recruit for what he wants to do next. He tells Moses to go have a talk with Pharaoh. I imagine Moses didn't know what to say to God's request. Talk about power and authority. But he knew this request was big and he anticipated that Pharaoh was going to laugh in his face. Moses was not really all that into oral communication, and so he had kind of a hard time getting his point across to God. But God knew what Moses was trying to say back to him. And God agreed, but God told Moses, I just need you to do what I am asking you to do. And so Moses met with Pharaoh. Pharaoh did not like the plan and he says a word that every two-year-old knows well, no. Pharaoh says, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? The Israelites have pro provided him great profit. No, I am not letting your people go. Take that and tell your God too. So God sends nine plagues. I'm abbreviating a couple of chapters here today, but I encourage you to go back and read them. God sends nine plagues. And after each plague, Pharaoh changes his mind. He summons Moses and says, the Israelites can go. I got it. And then Pharaoh remembers his prophet or something creeps into his mind and he changes it. And he says, nope, I'm not letting your people go. This back and forth happens through nine plagues. And here we are today in Exodus. 
Today, God is about to send the 10th plague. For the 10th plague and the final plague, God has the Israelites to sacrifice an offering. You've been reading. The Jews have been told to mark their doors with the blood of the lamb that they've sacrificed as a Passover offering. And so God passes over their homes. For the 10th plague, the firstborn of every Egyptian household is killed. But because of the blood on the doorposts of each Israelite household, their homes are spared. God is doing something for the Israelites that they could not do for themselves. For the Israelites, their God was powerful and worthy of reverence and obedience. So let me pause to say I cannot overlook the innocent lives that are slaughtered in this text that this slaughtering of the firstborn of the Egyptian babies is not a God I recognize, not a God I know, nor the slaughtering of the Israelite babies a couple of decades ago when Pharaoh issued the same decree over the Israelites. And yet I understand that the Israelites in a different time period than the one we're living in, with different customs and with different sensibilities and understandings about God, did understand God to be the one who would smite a whole ethnic group out and its firstborn, if that's what it took for God to free God's people. And we may never be able to access or understand that God the way that they did, but this is a central story to the Israelites' journey. And the 10th plague, God is going to free them, but that's next Sunday, so you got to come back. But before God frees them, God gives them instructions on the Passover party. Every year, I need you to have a big party and celebrate the Lord your God bringing you out of Egypt. I want you to bring the finest silverware and the best lamb, and I want you to have that unleavened bread and have a party because on this day, God delivered you from an oppressive situation. And I want you to have this Passover party every year at the same time. In Judaism, to this day, this is one of the highest holy days in their observance. Jews who practice nothing else all year practice the Passover party, which goes for seven to eight days. Let us celebrate this accomplishment. Let us celebrate what God has done. Let us celebrate what God is doing. This story is so powerful that we are reading today that when the slaves were brought to America from Africa and given this new religion, they found this story and this story blessed them. The Negro slave would talk about Moses, a name given to Harriet Tubman and the Israelites. They believed that God would deliver them from such an awful grip as the hand of slavery, just like God delivered the Israelites. They latched on to the figures and the story and began to orally narrate their own story of God delivering them. Paul Robeson even began these words, my Lord delivered Daniel, delivered Daniel, delivered Daniel, my Lord delivered Daniel, and why not every man? All oppressed people understand and crave that they might be free. The Alvin Ellie Dancer's signature piece involves the depiction of God delivering the Israelites out of Egypt and thereby delivering African Americans. Parties are important. Last week, my mom and family were excited to attend a special party. At first, it was hard for me to understand what was going on. It wasn't a baby shower, it wasn't a bridal shower, it wasn't a birthday party. But you see, 30 years ago, a cousin of mine lost her battle to cancer. And she left behind an 11-year-old, dynamic, sassy, intelligent girl child. That 11-year-old became a beautiful woman and in her 20s discovered she had this same cancer that had touched and killed significant number of women in her family. She did something unheard of and she had a most invasive surgery followed by intense chemotherapy. And last Saturday, she had a survivor party but I need to spell it for you so you really get it. 
S U R F I V E O R, survive or party. You see, if cancer doesn't return in five years, some doctors believe that you are truly cancer free. That's a mark. So you see, after five years, she decided it was time for her to have a Sir Five Er party. Parties are important. It's important for us to celebrate five years or 10 years or one year, or however many years. It's important for us to celebrate our accomplishment. If God has done something for you, celebrate, be appreciative, be grateful. I appreciate that every year our church member Carla Flournoy celebrates her birthday big. And she invites others to come out to a restaurant and enjoy her birthday with us because she's celebrating that God got her through one more year. In some cultures, birthdays are important, like there's a big celebration for Mexicans when their daughter turns 16. In the Jewish culture, there's a bar mitzvah for when their males turn 13 years old. For some people, they celebrate turning 21. I'm not sure if it's because they drink alcohol or that's the official age of adulthood. I'm not sure, but at 21, that's a big party celebration. And people celebrate 50, that's a big party celebration. And 80 and 90 and, well, you get it, it's great. It's great. Find ways in the heaviness of this lived experience we are in now to celebrate, to discover the joy of celebration. I saw on Facebook yesterday the Audrains gathered in their backyard celebrating 60 years of marriage. To be married to anybody for a period of time is an accomplishment. Now, uh, somebody ought to say amen. <laughs> But to be married for 60 years and have kids and have grandkids that genuinely like you, well, that's an accomplishment. It is important for all of us to celebrate, to celebrate the small accomplishments as well as the big ones. On the seesaw of life, if you just put your weight on one side of the seesaw, the other side will tilt in that direction. It is always interesting on the playground to see a child go sit on a seesaw all by themselves. Because what happens is the other part of the seesaw flips up and the seesaw tilts in one direction. It works when you put your body on the other side when you have someone of similar or proportional weight. Something interesting happens with the seesaw and then life and children and play become balanced. And so in life, it's important in the seesaw of life that we balance the bitter with the sweet, that we balance the sour with hope. If you are watching too much news these days, the seesaw is going to tilt in one direction. If you are isolating yourself, the seesaw is going to tilt in one direction. If you are living in too much fear, the seesaw is going to tilt in one direction. We must balance these days with our faith and living in community. It didn't get easy for the Israelites, but they would always remember what God had done for them. They kept their faith and they stayed in community. They would get bombarded by everyday struggles, and you're about to hear that in the coming Sundays, but every year they had a Passover party. They celebrated what God had did for them. They remembered. Do you remember what God did for you? Do you remember what God has done for you? Today I began by talking about the life of Chadwick Bozeman. He was born November 29, 1976, and on August 28, 2020, he died. I remember hearing at a funeral, we have two dates, the day we are born and the day we die. And what we do in between those two dates, well, that's our gift to God. I invite you as a gift to God to put some celebration on your calendar. 
to put some celebration in your life. On lawns across the city are posters highlighting that a particular person in the household has graduated from an institution. My next door neighbors have on their lawn that there's a graduate from the University of Chicago Lab School. I'm like, wow. I've seen folks take their kids by the institutions that they graduated from so that they could take pictures of their kids in caps and robes. One dad was overzealous and he also owned a little bit of Home Depot and he built a stage in his yard so that his child and one other child could walk up the steps and receive their diploma. Other of my friends and people across the city have had backyard celebrations where we socially distance and serve safe food. People have pushed themselves to find ways to celebrate, even under the conditions of a new normal. Chadwick found a way to live his life, offering a hero to marginalized people for whom there are not enough role models in this world. He gave us the Black Panther. The Passover party is the central story of the Torah, and the Israelites never forgot. What God did for Israel was big, and what God will do for you is also big. What God has done for us and the ways in which God shows up is worthy of celebration. Let us balance this season where it feels like the boat is tiltering. Let us balance this season where we ain't even gonna ask the question, can it get any worse? Let us balance this season where the numbers are a little bit scary. Let us balance this season of great loss of people who have transitioned. Let us balance it with remembering our God, with celebration, with parties, with gratitude and laughter for just how far God has brought us and for God keeping us. Amen. <laughs>